So this is the new Aperture 3 interface. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the best experience you'll have in Aperture in terms of your system. So let's start there. If you have a computer with a fast GPU, not a CPU, but a fast GPU, you're going to have the best Aperture experience because Aperture is very GPU or graphics processing unit dependent. In the old days, this software all ran on the CPU, but now we're on the GPU. So it's actually better to have a less expensive computer if you can't afford the top of the line and spend your money on the GPU. The other thing that Aperture likes is memory and lots of it. The more RAM you can get, the better off you'll be. And what do we say about RAM? You can never have too much Kentucky Fried Chicken, too much money, or too much RAM. So uh, that's the way to go. And uh, lastly, we want to have fast hard drives. 7,200 RPM drives are what we want. If you're using slower drives than that, you're not going to have the best experience. Um, I actually... <laughs> I'm not sponsored by G Drive. I don't know what the relationship with Creative Drive, uh, Live is, but I can tell you I use the G Drives. That's what I use all day long. I brought a presentation here today on the G Drives. They're the fastest, quietest drives uh, and, and well-built, so that's what I recommend if you use G Drives. If you have a lot of stuff, then you've got to look at bigger solutions like Drobo's or what I happen to use now, which are Promise Drives, which are 16 terabyte drives that are fast rate arrays. But that's only if you've got thousands and thousands of pictures. So. Getting, getting into uh, Aperture and looking at it, the first thing I want you to do is go open the Aperture menu and get the preferences up because we want to make sure that we get our preferences set to get the best experience. And let's just sort of walk through this quickly. Um, in the General tab, the first thing you're going to see very important is you're going to see where your, your library is stored. If you have pictures in Aperture and they're being managed by Aperture, they're being stored in what's called a library, and this is going to give you the physical location. You can change that. You can also click this Reveal button, which will actually show you that in the Finder, which is kind of cool. Um, they didn't used to have that before. Now, I don't, want you to, I don't want you to get too worried about this because a lot of times people ask me when they're storing pictures in the Aperture library, they're like, well, I can't get them back. They're in this library and they're held hostage. No, because the library is just a package. And a package is just a fancy term for an icon representing something. I'm going to try to move this out of the way. See this little thing right up here that says G Drive Mini? That's a package. That represents the hard drive I happen to have attached to this computer. If you double click it, you can see what's inside it. Well, the Aperture library requires a little bit more work than that, but you can actually get into it and physically mess with the files if you want. Your, all your original TIFFs and PSDs and whatever you brought in are there. Now, I don't recommend you play with those because if you put them in the wrong place, the Aperture library, library may send you a little message that goes, hi, you know that picture that's supposed to be here? It's not here anymore. So I would recommend you don't mess with it, but it's there, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, the options on the general tab you want to look at is you can automatically stack new versions. Let me tell you what stacking is. Stacking is when you bring in a bunch of pictures that were shot in a short burst, like and they all might be very similar, but just a slight change. You can choose to automatically stack them so they're all standing on top of each other. It gives you more screen real estate. I don't automatically do it. It's easy to do it later, but if you want to do it automatically, you can. You can click scroll to navigate photos in the viewer. I don't mess with that. You can click Enable Faces. I love to disable that. And the reason is, is I'm not going to kid you, the Faces thing is still a little hooky. Um, you know, that's Latin for it doesn't work real good. Um, we're, we're, you know, if, if you want to use Faces, go for it. But uh, it definitely slows the performance down, and it has caused some crashes. It's one of the last things to be fixed. And yes, I'm no longer sponsored by Apple. Um, <laughs> And sorry to interrupt, but could you just explain for folks that don't know what Faces is? Just oh, yeah, we're going to cover, okay. cover it. We're going to cover it. Yeah, Faces is just basically lets you connect the dots using facial recognition software so that it says, oh, that's Aunt Jane. And then it goes, is this Aunt Jane? And the problem is they take the picture I shot of a gorilla in Rwanda and say, is this Aunt Jane? And I'm pretty sure my Aunt Jane would be offended by that question. So we don't, uh, we, you know, but if you want to mess with it, go ahead. I know that Apple is working on both faces and places, tightening them up, and I'm sure in the next rev we'll get those fixed. Let's move to appearance. This is your next thing you can control. Viewer brightness, 
See the viewer in the background? That's the viewer. Do you like to have a complete black background when you look at your photos, as many people do? Do you like a complete white background? The default is 18% gray. Me personally, I like it on black, so I set mine to black. This is purely to taste. It's chocolate, vanilla, strawberry. It's all ice cream, whatever you like, you know. Um, we have the full screen br viewer brightness. I don't mess with that. The browser uh, brightness, I don't mess with that. But the viewer brightness, I like to set to zero. Now, if you have two displays, and many of you do these days because monitors are getting cheap, you can decide how you want things to work, whether your slideshows, for instance, are going to be on the second display or the main display by default. You also have the opportunity to click the loading indicator while full-size photos load. You know, I like to do that because it gives me an idea where I'm at. Show tool tips on controls. If you are new to Aperture, I highly, highly recommend that you enable this preference. That means when you're in Aperture and you float the mouse over a tool, it's going to give you the shortcut for it or tell you what it does. So that's a very good thing if you're brand new to Aperture. Show the number of versions for projects and albums. If you have an image which Aperture has created as a version, meaning it's a, a copy of the master file. You can see how many of those are in, in projects and albums. I personally don't find that all that useful, so I click it off. Badge referenced items. We're going to get into this when we make some adjustments. There'll be a little icon that pops up on the picture that tells you you've changed something. If this is not enabled, you won't see that little icon. So it's kind of a nice way to say when you're looking at your pictures like two years from now, you go, did I mess with that? Or is that right out of the camera like that? Well, if you messed with it, the badge will tell you. If you don't check this, there'll be no badge. So I like to check it. And then if you're using faces, you can use this kind of smarmy little corkboard thing to put the faces on, which looks like you've taken a Polaroid and stuck a pin through it and put the faces picture on there. I'm going to promptly uncheck that. Import. Do you want to use Aperture when you connect your digital camera? Now, it's completely up to you. If Aperture is the only program you use, then you might want to say yes. You might want to pick another program, or you can decide later. You just click the Decide Later button, and away you go. And at this point, you'll see the applications you could choose are all here. And it'll ask you what you want to do in terms of imports on default. So a new project is what I prefer. And then auto split into projects. You can take projects and split them into smaller groups. I haven't found that all that useful yet, but I'm still playing with it. Export, very important, very important, this particular tab. I know this preference and stuff is not the sexiest thing we're going to cover during the show, but boy, if you don't get this right, you're going to wish you did. Um, when it comes to export, you want to pick your external photo editor here. If uh, any of you guys here using uh, Photoshop, I need to see hands. Because you see, the, the, the nodding doesn't translate very well to the creative live audience. Um, we have a lot of hands. I'm assuming they might be able to be seen on the camera. If you use Photoshop and you want to, oh, I guess it can't be seen on the camera, so it doesn't matter. But at least it makes me know what you're saying. Um, uh, if you want to use Photoshop to do what we call round tripping your images, meaning you can work on them in Aperture and then send them to Photoshop and do some magic to them there and then bring them back to Aperture, you need to tell Aperture where that app is. So you click choose and then you go through here and you go, oh, I'm looking for Photoshop CS4 and you click it and away you go. But since this isn't my computer, I'm not going to do that. Uh, then it asks you how you want to send those files as TIFFs or Photoshop files, 8 or 16 bit. Me personally, I like to send them to Photoshop when that's my external editor as Photoshop 16 bit files. And I like to use 16 bit because the more data, the better. I'll explain why in a little bit later, uh, probably next week. Uh, but if you're not using Photoshop and using some other kind of editor, I recommend TIFFs. TIFF stands for Tagged Image File Format. PSD stands for Photoshop something D. Photoshop document, yeah. It was a joke. You weren't supposed to tell the answer. That's OK. Um, now, the color space. We have many to choose from. Uh, my recommendation is Adobe RGB 1998. And we're not going to have the whole big debate here over whether extended ranges are a good idea. I'm giving you my recommendation based on what I do. Um, if you're going to never, ever, 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 times a million, ever, 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 times another million, make a print of one of your photographs in the arrest of all eternity, and 
only, only, only times a million going to put your images on the web or online, then I would say make that sRGB. But if you're going to work anywhere else ever, or it may even possibly, let's work with a wider color gamut. This has to do with how many colors Aperture can put in the palette for you to work with. Now, if you have an external uh, audio and video editor like Final Cut Pro or Soundtrack Pro, and you want to be able to round trip your videos as well, this is where you would select those. And if you want to be able to use Aperture's built-in email function so that you can quickly click a button and email a photo to somebody, you want to pick the program. Your choices are America Online. <laughs> Come on, what is this, 1875? <laughs> Will all three of you with American Online's account please tell us? Um, uh, that's one of the choices, meaning, forget it, uh, mail, which is uh, Max internal mail program, Eudora and Microsoft Exchange. Those are your choices. Love them all. Um, then it's going to ask you how you want to send this. And there's a whole bunch of presets here that Aperture's already made for you. So you can say, I want to send it as a JPEG, a TIFF, a PNG, recommended typically for email. We're going to go with JPEG. And typically, we don't want to use a really big file for an email. So maybe we're going to go with 50% of original size or yeah, uh, uh, go down here to edit. And this gives us the ability to click this little plus button and make some new kind of preset. In this case, we'll say Scott preset. And it allows us to say, include metadata or not. The file will be about six kilobytes smaller if we don't. And I'm going to say fit within pixels. And then I'm going to say no more than 640 on any side. And then. You know, there are a few monitors out there these days at 96 PPI, but uh, 72 will work. And I'm going to use the sRGB color profile because I'm converting to JPEG. I do recommend the use of black point compensation. And if you are very paranoid and you want to, you can even create a watermark. Click here, show watermark, position it. You have to have an image already built as your watermark on the, the, the desktop or on your computer somewhere but we'll skip that. So I just made my own preset. You can modify presets, etc. Click OK, and that's how I would do the email. There's a ton of control in Aperture when it comes to this kind of stuff. Now remember when I said let's think conceptually? What I just showed you applies to virtually every preset in Aperture. I showed you how to edit and create your own presets. Every single thing we do in Aperture where presets are involved, it's the same exact interface. It's the same exact methodology. So if you've learned it once, now you can go brag about, I know how to edit all the presets in Aperture, baby, because they're all the same, just exactly like that. This is why this thinking conceptually is important, because Aperture is very good at sticking to its guns. When you do it this way, you tend to do it this way throughout the program, a whole bunch of different ways. So um, you can include location info on exported photos. Uh, those of you, anybody here into geotagging? You're the one guy. No, two guys. Do you have one of those little geotag things on your camera? Um, I did, but now I just use Aperture. He did have one on. Now he just uses Aperture. So if you, if you do geotagging, I'm assuming it's important to you, you'll want to include that location data maybe when you're sending uh, things. And you can inf include face info, which is, you know, remarkably unuseful to me, but perhaps it will be to you. Me, I revel in being able to uncheck both these boxes for myself because, you know, I, I can always figure out where I took the photo because I was there. Um, I still don't get the geotagging thing afterwards. You need to help me understand what I'm missing because I know part of it's I'm just old, so therefore I'm just not cool, and that's cool, so therefore it can't apply to me, but someday I need to figure it out. Labels. Labels is new, the way you can use labels in Aperture, and let me tell you, I'm primarily a wildlife photographer, and I'm primarily within my wildlife photography an avian photographer. I photograph birds. Now, what this is really cool is how this is cool is I have 500,000 bird photos in my library. And believe it or not, some magazine buyers who use these photos <laughs> are as disinterested in the images can be to the point of saying, do you got any pictures of red birds? Because we got a red cover, and we thought a red bird would look real good on the red cover. You know, nothing deflates your ego like finding out that you are just art to an art director and nothing else matters that you like stood in the wind for five days to catch this very rare red bird. 
So I use these to actually code the colors of the birds I photograph because I start to get all kinds of questions about that. But what's really cool is you can change these labels. Somebody watching did not know that. You can just simply click here and say, from now on, red means mean. For instance, if I were a wedding photographer and there was a mean grandma who was haunting me for the entire wedding, I would assign the red label to her, and that would be mean. And then orange would be nice for the nice grandma. And then yellow would be bride. All the pictures of the bride would be yellow. And then groom, well, we really don't need a groom selection because he's basically there to say, I do. And they take one picture of him and we move on. But we'll go ahead and put groom. But you see how this can work? You, you can assign these colors any value you want. Can we give a little bit of applause to Apple for that? Because I just think. We're getting some aid, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, from the chat room. They are applauding in terms of you know the live audience. Sir, do you have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, you can import from the folders. Mm -hmm. Does Aperture allow you to import files into specific folders? Yes, like to, uh, and we're going to do that in just a minute. Okay. Previews. Aperture creates JPEG previews of your photos. You get to decide if you want it to be automatically done or if you want to just go ahead and use the embedded JPEG, because many cameras are now doing embedded JPEGs. And then it wants to know if you're going to share these previews with other Apple products in the iLife and iWork suite. And it wants to know what size. Basically, you can fill all this out to your heart's content the way you like to do it. But just so you know, I do like to automatically generate previews because it just speeds thing up, things up later, but it slows down the import process. So that's the trade-off. If you don't mind slowing down the import process, click there. If you want the import process just to be PDQ, pretty darn quick, then go ahead and uncheck that. And if you've got embedded JPEGs, that will speed things up too. Now, me, I don't share with iPhoto, iLife, iWork, my Aperture stuff, because I tend to do professional level uh, publishing. So I don't do that, and it's just sa it just saves time if I don't have to have Aperture build the connection point between the two. It takes a little bit longer if you do that. Uh, the photo preview, I actually don't limit my photo previews because I like to work with very high quality JPEGs when I'm doing the previews. You, however, may have the absolute opposite experience and may want to go down here to the half size or 1280 by 1280. That's strictly a matter of choice. Just remember, the larger the preview, the longer it will take. So that's all. And then the photo preview quality, I, I hang out down here at like six to seven and I get really good results. Web, your mobile me account configuration is not correct. If you click web and you don't have mobile me, you're gonna get this. And web is of little preference if you don't uh, have mobile me, but you can skip past that screen and do some other stuff here, but frankly, it's mostly for mobile me. Advanced. Now this is the hot area threshold and cold area threshold. This has to do with clipping. This is where Aperture is going to make a determination at what point are you clipping. So you can cheat this back a little bit. We used to, in the old Photoshop days, we used to cheat this back to about 98% on the, the hot area and about 2% on the cold area. But to tell you the truth, I don't see a big difference in Aperture 3. So I'm leaving them at 0 and 100%. That means you know, that we're, we're going to just trust that Aperture knows where the clipping is. Clipping means that you have blown out whites or blocked up or no details in the blacks. Um, and then you can adjust those. I leave these typically right about here, I think, but I brought my own copy of Aperture just to double check because I've been experimenting with this in Aperture 3. It's a little different experience than uh, what I had in Aperture 2. This, the, the program has been quite a bit reworked. And uh, let me just double check. Yep, I do still leave them at 10% uh, at or less. I've, I've actually been experimenting with 0% here and uh, getting OK. Clipping overlay in color or monochrome, I prefer color. And look up places, for me, never. Because once again, that is going to slow things down. Create new versions when making adjustments. This is a personal preference that I happen to say yes to. Whenever I make an adjustment, Aperture will automatically create a new version. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, but Scott, that's going to take up a lot of hard disk space. Eh, eh, because it's not. It's all virtual. Anybody from the video world might be familiar with the term EDL, edit display list. Basically, what's going on here 
is we're just creating an XML file. It's a text file, which you can, in fact, actually look at using any text editor, and you can just see the lines of code. It's about six to eight kilobytes. So Aperture isn't actually making a new copy of your photo. It's making a virtual copy. But the physical presentation of that is easier to deal with when you say, well, here's the one I didn't work with, and here's the one I did work with. It's actually all the same file. Nothing actually happens till you render. But I, I like to have it... Uh, you know, do it automatically. You may not care. It's confusing to some people. It's a personal preference. Did that make sense? Because it didn't sound like it made sense when I said it, but it made sense in my mind, but not out of my mouth. Okay, so we've gone through all that. Any questions on the preferences? We have a question in the audience. On the labels, if you change, uh, initially you said, you know, you used red bird, and then later you said you used mean. It changes through the whole so if you change it, it changes all? Yeah, that's going to be okay. your, permanent, your permanent change to the label every time you use that color from now on, unless you go in and change it again. Uh, yes, I have a question as, as well. In terms of somebody who's a new to Aperture, who's coming from, from using iPhoto and Photoshop, and so, so, so I, have, I, have, um, I have my iPhoto library, plus I have a bunch of other... Um, folders that I have have pictures in. I, is it best to bring them all into ap Aperture, or is, is it okay to leave them where they are? Just depends. If you want to have access to them in Aperture, you'll need to bring them in, or you can do what's called reference files, and we're going to get to that in just a little okay. bit. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I Anna? have some questions from, from the chat room. Uh, several folks wanted to know why you choose the black point compensation as a default. It's an extraordinarily scientific reason. Some guy told me to. And that guy was a big shot at Apple. Joe. Joe is his Dave. name. Actually, uh, one of the engineers at Apple said you'll get better results if you do that. I had a sit down with the Aperture team. Uh, back in the day when it first came out, and he said, I think you should use black point compensation. And here's the kind of guy I am. When a dude who works at Apple wearing like a white coat who has like five special security doors he has to go through to get to his office says use black point compensation, that's why I do it. Probably not the answer they were looking for, but it's the truth. Bruce. Scott, from Twitter, uh, Hito in France asks, is it possible to create a library on a USB external drive? It, it is. He's getting errors. Well, then he has some sort of problem beyond the scope of this session. Kay. But tell him to email me, and I'll try to work it through. Great. And another question from chat uh, that some other folks answered, but for those folks who are not in chat, uh, they would like to know, can Aperture convert to DNG upon import? Yes. Oh, yes. Folks were saying no. You <laughs> can convert to DNG if you – now, I, maybe I don't understand the question. You can import upon a DNG. Uh, so ch tr um, oh, you mean change it, it. Oh, I'm to sorry. DNG no, you can import a DNG. Import. You okay. can import a DNG. But you, it but you there's no function it. to automatically no. import no. your raw files sorry, as I misunderstood. into DNG. Yeah. Okay, thank but you. But you can import a DNG. Right. Okay, thanks. Yes? I have a question from the chat room. Uh, does Aperture 3 actually delete the orphan previews, thumbnails, etc., from the package when a master file is deleted? If Aperture you actually go through, and we're going to get to this in a minute, if you actually go through and delete, delete, it goes to the Aperture Trash. And then if you delete the Aperture Trash, it goes to the System Trash. And if you delete the System Trash, it's just like the Constitution. It's history. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's get into uh, the next step. I want to talk about uh, th the interface really quickly. Um, it's very customizable. You can make just about anything you want be anywhere you want. The main three icons you want to mess with are right here. This is the browser view, the split view, and the viewer view. Now I'm going to actually go ahead and uh, enable a photograph here. So the browser view is going to show you a bunch of photographs from your folder. The split view is going to create a little timeline down here that you can work with. And the viewer is just going to simply bring the image up full screen within the window. So these are your three primary sections that you want to play with. Now, if you hit the V key, I'm not 
the world's smartest guy when it comes to shortcuts. I want to tell you right now. Part of getting old is I got, you know, I got the Alzheimer's a little early, so I can't remember all of them. But this is the one I remember a lot because I use a lot. The V key will cycle through these. So if you don't want to mess with clicking on these icons, you can just hit the V key and switch through them. That's kind of a cool thing. Um, now, over here are the next three most important things to know about. These are the library, the metadata, data, and the adjustments tabs. And you'll spend some time with all three of these. In Aperture 3, this is all considerably streamlined over what it used to be in Aperture 1 and 2. I like it much better this way. So you can see the library view. This lets you know what you've got going on. Here's the metadata of any given picture. And here's how you make adjustments. Here's how you tweak photos. So those three in conjunction with the view give you an awful lot of power. Now, the rest of these buttons, notice that when I put my mouse cursor over this, you see it says what it is. It's the show or hide the inspector. Notice the inspector went away. Now the inspector comes back. Also notice the uh, little eye out here. That's the shortcut key. Um, not all of them have buttons, sorry. New Flickr album. This would create a new Flickr album for you. So you see when you just point your mouse to something, this is why I said it was important if you're new to Aperture to go ahead and enable this preference. Now if you leave it there, it'll eventually go away and you kind of move it, move it back over there. But it'll tell you what everything is. And, and this conceptually is very important. This is something I really hope everybody will do. In the privacy of your own home, when your spouse isn't watching, simply let the mouse hover over each and every icon in Aperture. It's a thrilling experience. But what'll happen is what happened to me is like, I was like, dang, I always wondered what that did. Well, now you know, because you just let, it'll tell you. It's brilliant. You just say, so is anybody looking? Browser metadata overlays, oh boy. You know, I like to call it aperture porn. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's an unusual way of exploring your interface, but it's fun. You can just hover to your heart's content and learn much about the program. So rather than trying to memorize during the short time we have together what all this stuff is, remember the concept. I can just park over this little puppy and it'll tell me what it is. Now in the case of split view, it divulges Incredibly important additional information. It says split view. So split view says split view. Not that helpful. But like we had with inspector, it shows you that it shows and hides the inspector and it gives you the shortcut key. So that's kind of cool. So, you know, we, we've got an idea here. Now, here's something that's kind of fun. This is the projects view. This is really slick. When you click this, everything goes away. And now watch this. Be prepared to be amazed. In fact, call your friends into the room because this is really something. <coughs> the sound effects are mine, not provided by Aperture. We can go over here. You can sort of, you know, skim through all of your pictures in a particular project. Now, how cool is that? So that's available in the projects view. Also, just so you know, you can change it around any way you want. It's pretty slick. And uh, you can double click to open a project. Everything works pretty much like you're used to if you're a Mac person. If you're not a Mac person, my first question to you is why are you paying attention to an Aperture class since it only runs on Macs? But you know, that's another story. Now what do you think would happen if I double click a particular image? Yep exactly what you thought would happen. It fills the screen, double click, it goes back. So this is the quickest way to get a good look at your photographs. Simply double click on them and double click and they'll go away. By the way, if you ever wondered why it sucks to be a salmon, this photograph answers that question. Let's hit the Z key and zoom in a little bit tighter to help you understand even more. Um, that, that's pretty straightforward. So you can move around really quickly. You can also go over here to the library and simply click on your projects over here. Now, the next thing I want to cover, because I really think this is cool, and this is one of the first areas that people start asking me questions a lot of time, is trying to understand the hierarchy of folders and projects 
and albums and Aperture. And it took me about, you know, 15 days to figure it out way back in the day when they first shipped it. But once I did, I hit myself in the forehead and said, no, now I get it. And I want to save you from having to hit yourself in the forehead. So here's how I use it. The first thing to know is you can create folders by simply going up here to the new, and then you have all these choices, folder, and then you get this untitled folder, and you can give it a name, etc. In this case, I'm going to delete it because I already made it. And I created one called Travel, and I created one called Wildlife. So if you have a lot of photos in your library uh, around certain topics or dates or projects, you could create a folder that represents genres that you find appealing. For instance, if you do wildlife and travel and weddings and sports, you could have four different folders that all of your projects lived in. So instead of having this big, long list of files down the left side of Aperture, which is confusing, you would just have those four folders that everything lives in. Now, it's important to understand these are logical, not physical. In other words, nothing is being created on your hard drive. No disk space is being used. It's just a logical representation so that you can see it the way you want. So in this case, I have the folder called Wildlife. And you'll notice within the folder called Wildlife, I have two projects. Now, projects are Aperture's native container, if you will, for your images. So you go out and you shoot a wedding tomorrow. And it's the Jones wedding. And you import it as the Jones wedding. It's going to create a project. That project will contain all the images from the Jones wedding. You might want to put that project in a larger folder called Weddings, where all of your weddings are. Is everybody following that? Now, you'll see that I have this Maui Copters project here. And this is from uh, last year when I taught at a workshop in Maui. And it's travel related. So I'm going to drag it. And this is all you have to do. I'm just going to drag it into the travel folder. Now, if I spin these up and close those, you'll see how nice and clean the interface is. All you see is the two folders. You see a folder for my travel shots. You see a folder for my wildlife shots. I can twirl this down and open it up, and now you can see the two projects within that folder. And the third level is albums. So an album is another logical, not physical, representation of your images. Now you'll notice that in Wolves Miscellaneous, the project, this photo here and this photo here reside in this project. But if you look in the Wolf Water album, you'll see the same two photos. Now, if you've been following closely, you understand that those are not additional copies of those two photos. These are simply logical representations of those two files that are in this other project. Does that make sense to everybody? Because if you don't get this now, it's going to be very tough later to figure out the hierarchy. If you can figure out that folders contain projects, projects contain albums, and the only thing that's really going on as far as storing images is the project. Everything else is just sort of like helping you organize. And you can rename these by simply putting your cursor here and clicking and typing on them. You can create new ones, you can delete them, you can move them around. They're very flexible, you have a lot of power here. It's extremely good way to organize your images. I can twirl that back up. And then now I can look at my travel folder, which we just dragged the, dragged or drug? We just drug the Maui Copters uh, project into travel. Pretty straightforward. Does that make sense? Everybody following me? Okay, any questions in the chat room on the hierarchy of folders, projects, and albums? Not too many questions here on the organization. Okay, one in the front. Have a large number of photographs as you do. Um, why do you choose to organize by by genre as opposed to chronological, like year and month folders? You know, I, I'm I'm just an old man, and I do things in the way that makes sense in my old man brain. But I'm not advocating that you do it any particular way. I have multiple aperture libraries. I have dozens of them. So some of them, the ones that are all done for commercial 
clients where I have a commercial client who's either paying me in advance or has ordered the images, etc., I'll actually have them uh, set up by the client's name and date. But it just depends on what I'm working with. For my personal work, I just kind of limit it to basic genres. Some people do it by date. Some people do it by you know country. That's the beauty of this. You can do it any way you want. Whatever makes sense to you. And one of the big concerns I hear from people when they're moving to a system like Aperture or Lightroom or any of them is they probably have something going on on their hard disk now that helps them kind of organize their photos. And this is reasonably representative of almost anything you would have on your own hard disk. So you can copy that structure and work within this just fine because you've probably got folders on your hard disk and inside folders might be, you know, nested folders, and so you just think of the folders here instead of nested folders that you just use the projects. Did that help? Yes. Chat room ladies, chat room guy. Yeah, question from the chat room. Uh, do you also use keywords then in your organization? Yes, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Okay. Hopefully, well, in just a few minutes. And Scott, I have a quick question from M. Larson in chat. If you delete a folder, also an album, do you, do you keep the pictures or does, are the pictures still there? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, if you if you delete a folder and it has a project in it and you delete the project, you delete the pictures. But only if there's a project in it. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay. Uh, Ruben Eves in the chat room would like to ask, are you are the photos always and only on the hard drive? There is just a mirror from them and when are they exported, or when they are exported, they exist. There they exist. Okay. Sorry, the question's a little confusing. Yeah, the photos do exist if, now, so far all we've discussed is Aperture's managed libraries. You can also do what's called reference libraries. In reference libraries, you've got the photos wherever you've got them, just exactly the way Lightroom does it. In the case of reference libraries, you're responsible for remembering where your pictures are, and Aperture keeps track of all them, and if you somehow delete them from where they were, or you lose that drive, or that drive goes bad, or you move them from this drive to that drive, and you don't tell Aperture, then you're going to be kind of messed up trying to find them. But in terms of the library itself, you can have more than one library. You can have as many as you want. You can merge these libraries later. You can do anything you want along those lines. And wherever you keep your Aperture libraries, they, res they reside there one copy of the photo resides there. The master copy that you made with your camera, sort of think of it as a digital negative, that resides there in perpetuity. Everything else we're talking about is a logical copy of it that's, you know, 6 to 12 kilobytes of data until you hit the export button, because that's the way Aperture works. So I think that's a pretty smart question. It kind of shows that they, they understand the process. Aperture only makes a physical new copy of the photo when you export it. You send it out as an email, or you send it out as a print, or you send it out as a book. Then they make an, a physical copy of it. But until then, it's just logical. And what's cool about that is you can make wicked changes and undo them that you can't do in Photoshop. I mean, I, I'll do something crazy. We're going to jump ahead, and I, I swore I wasn't going to do this, but I can't help it because I want to. Crazy. I'm going to go to the Adjustments pane here, and I'm going to hit the C key, which mysteriously stands for crop and that's going to bring up the crop tool the crop tool lets me do all kinds of cool things I'm going to say I do not want to constrain the crop tool and what I have here is I went on a helicopter tour with a doors off helicopter ride with the blue Hawaiian helicopter people in Maui if you ever get a chance to do that I highly recommend it and so down below me was this guy windsurfing now what you can't see in this photo is he's about nine miles offshore and I began to get concerned for his ability to get back if the wind doesn't go the right direction, but I guess he made it. But let's say I don't like the cropping here and I want to go in and crop it. So I can crop it differently, like this, by simply drawing a box, okay, I'm gonna hit the enter key. So now it's cropped. Now I'm about to blow your mind. I'm gonna go in here and change the exposure and then I'm going to say file, export, blah, blah, blah. Oh, wait, I don't like the crop. Well, too bad, Bubba, you cropped it. Uh, excuse me. Because it is a logical representation of the picture, I can simply uncheck crop, oh, and there it is. Because, see, I didn't actually make any changes to the photo. I simply changed the edit display list, the little XML sidecar file, to say do this, do this, do this. 
and none of that actually happens until we make the exported image. So if I had exported the photograph, then that copy would have been cropped, but the master is always available for me to crop, uncrop, not crop, and I'm only jumping ahead to this to help answer that person's question, help them understand that there's only one real copy of the photograph, unless I duplicate the master, which I'm not sure I know of any reason to do that. See, one of the things that's weird here is you don't save like you do in Photoshop. There's no save. Everyone asks me, where's the save as? Well, the save as, I'll show you where it is. File, export. That's the save as. <laughs> you export the image if you want to save it out as something. But there's no, you'll, you, you know, you're not going to find the word save here on the file menu, which is kind of weird. But it's because nothing's being permanently changed until you export. Yes, Kenneth. Yes, I have a question from Jay Pinto in the chat. Is You mentioned that you have uh, 12, 15, however many libraries. Is there a reason to do that? And are the libraries better being small versus large? Does that be make them slower or faster? Excellent question. Yes, the reason to do that is, is that the larger your library gets, the more prone to errors the database becomes. And once again, that Latin word hooky gets hooky. Gets a little sideways on you. Um, I found that Aperture 3, finally with version 3.02, is stable enough that I don't worry about the larger libraries. With Aperture 2, at 10,000 images, the libraries became very slow and bogged down and, and constantly needed to be re-indexed for me. That was my experience. I'm not saying it's anybody else's. So I keep the smaller libraries partly because of that. It's a, better, it's a performance issue. And the other reason I keep them small is that um, a lot of the libraries we do have are for the commercial side of our business, and we just we just create a library per job. So I know that you know this client, there's a library for that client's job, and I never have to wonder where that job is located. 